Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would descend and that you would strengthen and engage us in the life of the church today. I pray you would open my mouth to speak your words to this, your people. I pray that you would open our ears to hear the message that you will send us. And then, Lord, that you would enable us as we receive that message into who we are. To, to go and to spread the message of your gospel, the love, your love for the world uh, throughout the land. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The church is called to function much like a pack of wolves. Now, we're not wolves ourselves, and it's kind of different for me to compare the church to a group of wolves, but... If you ever watch how a, a pack of wolves functions, uh, then, then you could see how the church is called to mirror their activity. In a pack of wolves, the strongest wolf is not in front of the pack. In fact, the strongest wolf in a pack stays all the way at the back. So that that wolf has vision of the entire pack and what's ahead of them. It's the second strongest wolf that leads the pack. And those who are weak, those who are injured, those who are young are squeezed between that back strongest wolf and the front second strongest wolf. This is the way that the pack of wolves can function organically uh, in a way that preserves life and ensures that the pack's safety and health is maintained. It's much like uh, how, how, how wolves are strategic in nature mirrors much how um, uh, we function on the hiking trail as a family. I think it's a bit natural. We don't really do it on purpose, but it happens this way every time. So my family and I, just a few days ago, as we were uh, celebrating Memorial Day, uh, decided that we would go uh, on a hike. And we ended up in North Carolina, um, close to Lenore at uh, several of the waterfalls in that area. We went to uh, several waterfalls, like I said, but as we were on the trails to get to those waterfalls, we, we hiked away. Some of it was strenuous, some of it was fairly easy, but every time I, I noticed that as we were hiking, we sort of took on the man mentality of a pack of wolves. It was either Janie or me in the back, keeping the, the whole family together and moving, uh, and then either Janie or me in the front, scouting as we were going and figuring out which way to go. And I thought that was much like a pack of wolves would function. The church is meant to function uh, a lot like what we hear um, in this comparison, this analogous comparison. Uh, we as a church are called to be thoughtful we as a church are called to be strategic and intentional in the decisions that we make in order that we would be the most efficient and effective body of Christ that God is calling us to be. That's all background for what takes place in the event that we just read about in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 recounts a strategic event where God decides to decisively act in the context of the world. God has decisively acted on several previous occasions. I'm going to review those quickly before we get to the event of the Holy Spirit's initiation into the world. The first way that we can know that God acted in our world was when God created God creates the world. We hear uh, about this creation in the book of Genesis. And we hear that God took his time 
in lovingly creating the world just as God wanted it to be. And we, as humans, were a part of this created order that God was putting into existence. We all know what happens next. After the creation, after the Spirit and, and soaring over the, the waters of the earth brings forth creation, we hear about the next story which is how the very first humans choose to go their own way instead of God's predetermined way for them. And so we fall into sin instead of following after God's way. But even so, God has a plan. God has a plan for how God will redeem and bring salvation for God's people, for humans on the face of the planet on the face of the created order. And so God sends Jesus into the world, another way that God decisively acts on our behalf. And we know that Jesus comes for a lot of good purpose, a lot of good reason. We know that Jesus comes to teach us how to live. We know that Jesus comes to be, to be born in a way that shows he comes not just for a segment of people, but for everybody. And we know that Jesus comes to die. He comes to give up his life as a sacrifice for us. And we know that Jesus comes even to be raised up from the dead. That he would uh, inspire new life and, and, and the spirit of new birth in us. These are the ways that God decisively acts in human history. There are many others. But with the Spirit's descent from heaven into the hearts and lives of the people expectantly waiting there for God to act, God again chooses to act decisively in human history. It's strategic. It's strategic. Because Jesus has already ascended into heaven. He's already died. He's already been resurrected from the grave. And now he has ascended into heaven. And it wouldn't take very long for people to start doubting that Jesus was there at all. And so it's a strategic act of God. It's well thought out that God would send God's spirit into the world to come alongside us. That is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit comes alongside us. So it is a decisive act of God that, that God would send God's Spirit to come alongside us and to be our helper, to be our advocate, to be one who is with us no matter what trials or tribulations we must face. We all know what trials and are during times like these. We all know what it's like to go from one day to the next, taking one step at a time, one breath at a time, and not necessarily knowing what's going to happen next, what's going to unfold next in this story. I've spoken on it already today during our prayer time, but many of us are dealing with loneliness and isolation even as our country seeks to open back up again, and many countries throughout the world seek to open back up again, we are still dealing with loneliness and isolation. A message from Acts 2 to us, no matter where we are or what difficulties and struggles we're facing, is this, that God is with us, and that God is active. We know these truths because we believe in what happened at Pentecost. We believe that the Spirit was sent on our behalf to help us and to be our advocate, to come alongside in a way that shows God's love and guides us along. So not only is God present, through God's Spirit, which comes alongside us. But God's power is at work through that Spirit, which has been laid upon us. 
us. It's evident in our scripture passage that the apparent barriers that the people were facing during uh, the time that the, that the first Pentecost, this Pentecost uh, took place, where, where the Pentecost took place, uh, it's apparent that the barriers that they were facing were being overcome by the presence of the Holy Spirit. The, pre the barriers that they faced were that they didn't speak the language of all the peoples that were gathering to come and hear. Uh, there were people from all over, from different areas in this Mediterranean world, that were coming to hear this message that the disciples were proclaiming. This message that Jesus uh, had lived, and that he had died, and that he had been raised up from the dead, and now that he had ascended to heaven. And people didn't know their language, so that they, they couldn't understand what it was that they were preaching, what they were telling uh, this good news, this gospel truth. But God acts in a, a decisive and significant way when God sends his Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit sometimes comes to us to comfort, sometimes comes to us to help. And in this case, it came in order to give the disciples, the apostles, the words to say to the people that couldn't even understand their language. The Holy Spirit inspires them in a way that they begin speaking the languages of those who have gathered around. And so, the apparent wall, the impossible task, the mountain before them, was overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit, which was then present with them. Now, there are two camps uh, in response to the Pentecost. One camp says that the Pentecost event, the event of Pentecost was a one-time deal. In other words, the Spirit came, and then the Spirit ascended back to heaven, and the Spirit is no longer with us. I am not uh, the type of person who believes that that is what took place at Pentecost. What I believe, and another way to understand the Pentecost event is this, that when the Spirit descended upon the disciples at the event of Pentecost, the Spirit never did leave after that. And the Spirit, just as it was hovering over the waters of creation, is now hovering over us, guiding us along, helping us along the journey, encouraging us to know that we are never alone, that we have a God who is with us and present for us and working on our behalf through the power of the Holy Spirit, no matter what trials or difficulties that we face. I have seen this spirit at work in perhaps ways that may surprise you. And as I tell this story in closing, I want you to think about all the ways that God has impacted your own life, whether it's in this season or a past one, or perhaps even as you're looking forward to the future and seeing how God expecting how God will be at work by God's Spirit. My story starts in a hospital room. Janie was pregnant with our second child. She was having contractions at home. We thought they were contractions, but after Logan, we knew that it could be something different. What happened with Logan was what she thought were contractions were actually was actually pain coming from her gallbladder. And so we didn't want to uh, jump to any conclusions in our situation this time with Charlie. Uh, but we wanted to be safe at the same time. And so as she felt pain, which felt like what she believed would be contractions, and as they increased and got stronger, we headed to the hospital. With Charlie, we had a specific doctor, his name is Dr. Erickson, uh, who was Janie's doctor. And as soon as we got to the hospital, he was paged, and he came to the hospital room and monitored Charlie's and Janie's activity as we were going through the process of having Charlie. And as we were there, um, her, her contractions increased, and Dr. Erickson started noting that as Janie's contractions increased, 
the baby, Charlie's, um, heart rate decreased. So when a mother has a contraction, the baby's heart rate is supposed to go up, not down. Uh, but in this case, it was causing Charlie's heart rate to go down every time Janie was having a contraction. And so Janie's doctor, Dr. Erickson, chose to decisively act out of his own professional opinion. And we went to uh, a C-section. Charlie, of course, was born safely. But what I want to tell you about was what happened to me in the midst of all this. We were cool. I was sitting in the hospital room with Janie. There were doctors and nurses coming in constantly to constantly assess what was going on for Janie. Dr. Erickson was there. I saw him. I knew him. We were saying, hey, everything was light. It was cool. Dr. Erickson's a cool doctor. I, I thought, nothing's wrong here. Everything is great. But as soon as he made his decision, everything changed. Everything shifted, including me being able to be in the room right beside Janie while she was going through all this. They put me in a room on my own. I was isolated from everything else. I was scared. I'm not afraid to say it. I was scared because I knew that my wife and child were in a situation of extreme intensity, high danger. And I was... In, I was helpless. I had no way of helping them in their context. The best thing that I could do was stay out of the way. But I believe that God was present in this situation. I believe that God was um, inspiring Dr. Erickson to know the right decisions to make. And indeed, it was the right decision to make. And here's why. After Charlie was born, they discovered that Janie's umbilical cord, or Charlie's umbilical cord, was actually wrapped around his neck two times. And so, when Janie was having contractions, it was causing such stress on Charlie that if they would have continued with the, the birth as, uh, as they had previously planned, then it would have become increasingly more dangerous, both for Charlie and for Janie. And so, God was using Dr. Erickson, inspiring Dr. Erickson through the way that he, he had learned. You know, he'd learned medicine, he, he'd gone through training, but even in this moment, I believe that God, with God's hand on Dr. Erickson, was guiding him to make the right decisions, both for Janie's and for Charlie's health. And today, as you know, Charlie and Logan and Janie, um, we are all safe and doing well. Here's what I want to say today uh, for those who are graduating and for those who are going through tremendous change during this season. We are facing unprecedented times. We are facing unbelievable change as a nation and as a world. And times are quite challenging. We can feel isolated and we can even feel fearful in the face of the mystery that we do not yet know fully. But the good news is this. You have gifts and talents. You have blessings that God has blessed you with. And God wants you to find ways in order for you to live into those blessings, live into those gifts and talents, those gifts and graces from God, in order that the world would be changed for the better by what you choose to do with those gifts that you've been given. And I believe, dear friends, that when you choose to do that, no matter what your context is, you bring Pentecost to more fullness in the life that you've been given. When you choose to receive the guidance of God and, and have your decisions guided by God's wisdom and grace, then you are bringing Pentecost 
into this world. You are allowing others to see the Spirit of God at work and using you for the sake of God's kingdom and the spread of Jesus' love throughout all the world. Today, dear friends, I hope you will find a way to spread Christ's love through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Kiss your children. Hug your parents. Be there for a brother or sister by calling them up on the phone. Go and write a letter to someone who you know needs a word of encouragement. Pick up the phone and call them. We're not limited in such a way that we can't talk to those that we love. Be with those who are even strangers to you. Reach out and do good to them too. Find ways to bring about the spirit of Pentecost through being the people of God today. Let's pray together. Lord God, we pray that you would continue to use your spirit to inspire and strengthen us. We pray, O oh God, that you would rain down that spirit of love. May it call us, the, the best part in us, to live according to your way of love, to reach out in hope and help uh, to those that, that we know and love and to those that we don't know. And then, Lord, we pray that we would experience the blessings of your kingdom life through the process of participating in your power. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, dear friends, as uh, we go to a time of offertory on the screen or uh, in, in the content section of the video, you will see ways that you can directly give and support the ministries at St. Luke. And we appreciate all that you are doing. Let's worship God together now with God's tithes and our offerings.
today in worship. Uh, we hope that you will join us again for one more week next week on June 7th. And then we will be able to be present and with one another here at uh, our church space. Or you can also gather at home and we'll continue to record that way. Here's the benediction. Receive the blessings that are yours in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit and use those blessings to transform the whole world. Amen.